I'm recording now. Sorry, everybody. I forgot to record and nobody reminded me. Actually, the instructions didn't say to record, but I want to record. I'll see what I do with the recording later. So I'm, I'm warning everybody who's on camera right now. I'm on recording. If you don't want your visible face and stuff on camera, go ahead and turn your camera off. Um, sorry about that. Um, so intentional content, it's really, really important to be intentional about what we're doing. And, and I was getting to Tech 21. We're no longer teaching by ourselves. We're teaching in groups often. Sometimes it's three professors. Sometimes it's four professors. I know I've worked with Reyes and I've worked with Jorge and I've worked with other people in, in groups where we're working together in teams. And um, sometimes we forget if you're assigning four assignments a week and every other professor is assigning four assignments a week as well, then we're assigning 16 assignments a week to our students and we're probably overloading them. And we should be thinking about um, working together about what kind of load we're putting on top of our students in these blocks that we're doing in Tech 21. So attentional content, big, big, big deal. Professional educator. So I will thank you all for being here. You made a conscious decision to show up in this session or you accidentally clicked on the wrong link and you're trying to figure out who this crazy Canadian is talking to you. Um, but you made a decision to be here. You're making a decision to either, you know, eat your breakfast or drink your coffee or not pay attention at all and pretend you're here and just ask for the assistance link so you can click on the assistance link, which is what our students used to do when we took attendance. Um, they would run into the classroom because they needed to be attendants because they already had six faltas and, uh, and then they wouldn't pay attention to your class. But you're, you're making a decision to be here. You're being a professional educator. You're making a decision to take notes or to uh, come back and look at it later because you're really busy today and I know you have to get something done for your position because you're a director of no sé qué and you need to submit some forms and it needs to be like yesterday, like all of the forms we need to submit. I'm guessing Jorge has to submit something today as well. We work together often. And, um, but you might come back to it later. You're, you're, you're bookmarking this link and you're saying, I'm gonna come back to this later. Or I'm gonna contact Ken later in Yammer. You're making a decision about your, um, development as a faculty member. Um, about six years ago, I think it's on my YouTube channel somewhere, um, I gave a talk for a flip conference in Australia. And the title of the talk, if I can remember correctly, was something about uh, who's responsible for development of faculty. Are administrators or us? And, and I'll control chaos. Um, my, uh, I'll, I'll get to that in a second. My, my answer to who's in control of our own professional development is actually probably about 70% ourselves and about 30% our administrators. Our administrators should guide us. You know, David Garza and company should be telling us this is the way we're moving. But a lot of control about our development as faculty is much more on us. Control chaos is, is um, letting go of control of our classrooms, but knowing when to pull it in. Okay, right now I don't have much chaos. You guys are not using that chat very much. I'm extremely disappointed. Um, but uh, controlling the chaos in the room is a good thing. Um, a lot of people, if you see videos about flip learning, especially by my colleague, um, Flipping Physics, which is an excellent person to watch if you're um, into uh, physics teaching, Flipping Physics, which is Jonathan Palma. Palmer Thomas, Flipping Physics. If you go to flippingphysics.com, I think it is, he talks about this, but he talks about that his, his classroom's chaotic. Um, an administrator will come into his classroom and they can't find a teacher because the teacher's not in the right place. They're not at the front of the room lecturing to the students. They're mixed within the classroom, working with their students in a chaotic environment and their classroom's really loud. And, and other, other colleagues get really upset because they're like, the, the classroom beside me is really loud. We can't learn anything here. And um, uh, I'll actually show you a video here. I think I have it linked up. Yeah, I do. Let me link you this. Um, I won't show it to you for the interest of time, but go ahead and see that. And if you listen to those videos, this is my students. Um, these are pretty old, actually. I would tell them to stand on their chairs. Some of them are standing on their chairs. In these new fangled colored Tech the 21 chairs, don't stand on those. They got wheels. Those are really dangerous. Um, I tell them to stand on their chairs a la uh, Robin Williams and Dead Poet Society and scream at the top of their lungs, it's okay to fail. And I tell them to be really loud and disturb the teachers in the other classrooms. Um, but it's a message I like to send to my students that, yeah, exactly, uh, Bill, uh, that it's really important to understand it's okay to be wrong in this class. 
it's okay to do something wrong because we're going to correct it later because you learned by failing. Um, got off topic of flipped uh, professional educator, but for me, it's really important. Be active, be an active teacher, go out and learn, uh, connect with the community. Please be active on Yammer and other places. Uh, check in time, flip hurdles. A big, huge thank you to John Bergman. He wrote uh, a series of blog posts. Um, I'm linking to one of the first ones. I had to relink it today because the link I had had died already. Um, it, he wrote about the four hurdles of flip learning, thinking, technology, time, training. And I added one in my version, which is trepidation. It's using the five T's. We're big fans of, uh, of onomatopoeia. Um, thinking. I remember when I first started teaching about flip learning the Tech de Monterey and people wanted to make it into a required course for teachers. They wanted to have teachers have to do things. My wife came home one day because my wife was a teacher at the Tech as a catheter, some of you know her, and she said, you and your silly flip learning thing, I now have to make a flip learning exercise for one class, I need to make an active learning exercise for another class, I got to do a gamification for one class. And there was all these rules about what they had to do and what they had to comply with as teachers. And I pushed back heavily on that. And I don't want to force any of you to do flip learning. Um, and neither does John Bergman and neither does other people that talk about this. The first hurdle to doing flipped, to making any change to your pedagogical approach is you have to be convinced that this is a good thing for you. And this is a good thing for your classroom. If someone's forcing you to do this, then it's not going to work. Okay, I'm, I'm a, I teach software engineering. One of the first things we learn in software engineering and as software development is get the engineers to give an estimate of how long it'll take them to do something. Because once they buy in by making it an estimate, they'll meet it. If you tell them how long they have to do something, then they get resistant automatically. As soon as you make a person make a conscious decision to do something, it's more likely they're going to do it. So the first hurdle to, the, to flip learning implementation is thinking. Have you thought about that you want to do something. Yeah, I'm a big proponent of Agile. I've been doing Agile since the 90s. Um, longer story about software engineering. Uh, technology. Um, I'm a computer science nerd. I'm a geek. I've been using computers since I've been 12 years old, probably early 1980s. Um, but I'm not a big proponent of using the new shiny toy. Okay. Use technology when it helps. Don't use technology just because it's technology and it's shiny. Okay. Um, but technology really does help. Uh, the fact that we can have this conversation from my bedroom because I broke my leg and I'm basically isolated in my bedroom for six weeks um, is a marvel. Um, the fact that we have this technology, the fact that you can go to, um, to Padlet and start putting your notes there. This is awesome. Okay. Embrace technology to do some things that we couldn't do before, especially now that we're doing a lot of things from home. Time. Um, this is something I grabbed onto right away. And I remember when I first started thinking about flip learning and I said, anything new takes time, right? And, and I asked for permission to get an unload of my classes so that I could spend a whole bunch of time teaching other professors how to do flip learning and spend time on getting good at flip learning. And the answer was no, <laughs> we're not giving you an unload academically to do this stuff, Ken. Uh, just do it in your own time. And it's true. Whenever we do something new, it takes time. I'm not going to lie to you. You're not going to get faster at teaching because you're doing flipped learning. Okay. We all know this. So you teach a new class, it takes you three times as much time to prepare a new class than if you're teaching the same class you've been teaching for years. This is normal. Anything new takes time. And please, administrators, recognize this when you're assigning classes to your teachers. If you're assigning them a whole bunch of classes they've never taught before, we need to realize this is going to be a heavy load on them. And, and actually, this came up in David's uh, talk on Monday about loads of professors in Tech 21, because almost everything is new for us. Training. Um, well, here we are. You're taking a training from someone who does flipped learning. Um, I think it's really important for any institution that wants to implement flipped learning or any pedagogy. You need to invest in training. You need to invest in mentoring. Um, one thing that I think that's really important at the Tech de Monterey, we should be doing more is having experienced people working with people with less experience, being a mentorship model, something like what they do very often in Korea and other locations. Um, but it, it takes an investment. It's actually one thing I really love about the model of Tech 21, and I love a lot of it, is um, having teachers work together on blocks 
is a massive opportunity for crossbreeding and learning things from each other. And I think it's a really important thing for us to learn. Um, you'll notice as well, I, I put credit to all photos that I'm using in my slides. I get really upset when I see people's slides and they're not giving credits to the photos and where they came from. All the photos I'm using are Creative Commons licensed and I have permission to use them. And my last T is trepidation. Um, flip learning, doing anything new is scary. Um, it's scary for the teachers. It's scary for the students. Um, if, if you try to do something new and your worry is I'm gonna get bad teaching evaluations at the end of the semester because I'm doing something weird and strange. This is a real worry and we have to know this as colleagues and as administrators that we need to give support for our teachers when they're trying to do innovation. And it's one thing that the tech does really well. We do give support. Um, we gotta be careful about that support. And we need to realize that any new change can have failure and that's okay. We're, we're, we're gonna expect many successes, but we're gonna expect some failures when we try to do innovative teaching. Um, and we also really need to be involved in the fact that our students are afraid of this. Many of our students, I'll get to that in a second, um, they're used to learning in a certain way. And as soon as you change the rules, they freak out. And that brings me to stakeholders. Five stakeholders in education, students, teachers, parents, administration, government. Someone mentioned parents the other day when we talked or earlier when we were talking about attendance. Students are the focus here. We really need to think about the impact of changing the pedagogy on our students. Active learning, like we're doing a lot of um, flip learning, other kinds of learning, a lot more learning in teams. The way we're doing evaluating is different with competency-based learning. We need to be aware that our students aren't used to this. Um, and, and believe it or not, the students that are most resistant to this type of change in learning are your A students. The students that are really good at, and I'll put in quotes, playing the game of school. Okay, they know how to comply. They know how to do the things based on what things worked. And they did this really well in kindergarten through grade 12, and they're in the university. And then this weird Canadian comes and changes the rules and I'm not giving them exactly instructions about what they need to do to comply. Professor, how many words does my essay have to be? I'm not gonna tell you that answer because if I tell you 500, you're just gonna fill out 500 words of crap that, well, it's 500 words, give me my A. Um, and so they're used to complying. And when I change the rules on them like this, it freaks them out. The fact that in a classroom of flip learning, and this is the beauty that I love of flip learning when we switch that I'm not lecturing. I spend most of my time in the classroom walking around and sitting beside my students, pre-COVID when I could sit beside my students, um, working with them individually or in small groups. I actually get students upset saying, hey, you're paying more attention to that student than you're paying to me. That's not fair. And then we have to get into a big discussion about what equity and fairness is. And the fact that some students need my attention more than other students is okay. And then we get into that whole ethical and social dilemma about fairness versus uh, equity. But we do have to realize that our students are impacted when we make these changes in our classroom and we need to be aware of it. And we need to listen to them, okay? Um, uh, a classic teacher meme here, what, what I do, what my friends think I do, what my mom thinks I do, and what I actually do. Um, teachers uh, need to make changes for flipped learning. We need to make um, changes in letting go of control of our classroom. Um, some people seem to think if you're doing flipped learning and you have this controlled chaos, as Ray has mentioned in the chat, you're not really preparing for your class because it's not all laid out nicely, five minutes on this topic, then seven minutes of doing this, and then three minutes of doing that. And the lesson plan we all learned when we started learning to teach, those of us that took some courses about education before we started teaching, not all of us did. Um, but if, in, a, in a controlled environment that's chaos, like a flipped learning classroom, you have to let go of control. And it's really hard. It's really hard to let go of control. And it's hard to teach the students to take control of the learning. Um, Michael Horn mentioned this on Monday and I thanked him on Twitter. Basically, Michael said lots of things that a lot of things are, are, we're already doing. And he knows this, he knows this, but the external voice is much stronger than the internal voice. Um, this is something I've learned as well when I go to give talks at other institutions. And I, and I know when people come from the external to give talks to us, 
the, the students need to adjust to this. And he talked about this, that what do you mean? I have to be the one who's doing the work. Parents, whether we like it or not, and this was a big social adjustment for me as a Canadian coming to Mexico, that parents were showing up to my office as the director of the program for computer science. I was like, what the heck? My mom didn't even go to my high school. Um, it, parents are involved in education and that's a good thing. Uh, that's a very good thing. And one thing that's really cool about flip learning, a colleague of mine, Martha Ramirez from uh, Bogota, Colombia, she, she talked about um, teaching English as a second language with flipped learning and how she'd send the students home with the content, right, either reading or video or whatever, and the student will be sitting in the living room watching a DVD because we got to be careful about accessibility. Not everyone has internet, as Pepe Escamilla was talking about in the session this morning. She distributed a DVD or a I don't know, I guess it was a DVD, maybe it was a VHS. No, Martha's young, it must've been a DVD. And so they'd be at home with, with the abuela and, and the mom and the dad and everyone else and they're learning poito, chicken, gallina, hen. And, and the parents are engaging with the education of their, of their children um, in a way that they can identify with, right? They're, they're seeing what their students, their children are learning, but we're not sending them home with the calculus homework and they're all trying their hair out, trying to figure out, I can't remember how I did calculus in 1983. Um, the beauty of flip learning is we send the individual content of reading and consuming and first contact with information at the home or the outside the classroom environment. We can get involved about how much homework we should be sending home. That's a different discussion. The actual hands-on doing the work is done inside the classroom where the students have access to the teaching expert. They have access to their colleagues and other students in the classroom where they can ask the questions that their mom and dad can't answer because they don't understand, you know, physics three. Um, so the, the parents are involved and I think it's really important to have parents involved in education and flipped learning can actually have a way of involving the parents in a really good way. Um, my son was um, studying at the Colegio Finlandes, which has a branch in Carretero, Guadalajara, we have two, and I gave a talk about flipped learning there. And one thing that I thought was really cool is all of the teachers recorded YouTube videos that were like introducing themselves to their students at the beginning of the, at the, beginning of the school year. And this blew my mind because I'd never thought about this, right? Because they have a different environment where they spend their time with the students for the entire year. It's not like we do in university or high school. And I, and I thought this was great because as a, as a parent, I got this little slip with a paper with a YouTube video link on it where the teacher was introducing herself to the students and the parents. And, and it was introducing their dog and their cat and their parakeet and their husband and their house. But I thought this was a really beautiful thing of bringing the parents involved into the education how we do this with the university is a different level, but I think it's important. Administration is obviously involved, and I put the boss there because Bruce Springsteen. Um, please don't do radical things in education and pedagogy in your classrooms without at least informing your bosses, okay? You should probably ask permission first, but don't make an uncomfortable situation where a student complains about a class and they're going to report to director or carrera or, well, director de tutora, mentor, and then it's going to come to the department chair and the department chair is going to be helpless. They're going, I have no idea what my teacher's doing. I'm screwed. Um, please communicate with your administration what kind of things you're doing in your classroom. Let them know. Look for their support. Um, don't just go making changes without involving um, your support system. We'll do it for time. We're doing, we've got like an hour left. Um, tools. And is anyone interrupting me here? because they should be afraid to let go of control and they're afraid of having the control and responsibility of their own. This is so important, Gabriela. It's really important. I've been doing this for 10 years. I've got lots of feedback from students. Trust me, they, they tell me this. They tell me this and it's really, really important. Um, and, and I'll emphasize, spend some time to take time out and talk to your students, right? Um, often in my classroom, I'll just like, okay, let's have a talk about metacognition and about your learning. And we go in down this deep path and like, Ken, you're supposed to be teaching us about software engineering. And I'm like, trust me, I'm, I'm, I'm teaching you about software engineering because you got to keep learning as soon as you leave university. You don't learn all this stuff in university and then you just go to your job and stop learning. Trust me, this is, this is the truth. Um, so 
talk to your students and listen. I love when parents write to me asking for reading material about what the kids are learning in class since they're talking nonstop about it at supper. Um, I think I shared this earlier, but let me do this now. If you go to my blog, I will post about this uh, talk later and, and put the links and stuff, but I've got some highlighted things at the top. Educator coffee, I'll talk about that a little later. Um, ungrading, I do a lot of work about ungrading and how to remove grading from the education process. You can read about that. Um, there's experts that are much more qualified than me about that and there's some links in there. Um, giving students an authentic voice. This is what I talked about yesterday with my student, Fridell. Um, and uh, I'm waiting for the page to load. And inside of here, this is a talk that I gave at the Congreso Internacional de Innovación Educativa in 2016 um, in Campesila de Mexico. And um, it was a talk about what I do in my classroom. It's mostly about connectivism, a la George Siemens. And these are videos from my students, Paula talking about her experience in my classroom and how active learning worked for her. But this is Fridell. She talked with the session with me yesterday, but this is Fridell's mom. Right. And so uh, the fact that we were doing open learning or open pedagogy and sharing everything on the Internet and my students were sharing out what they were doing on Twitter. Tanya started following me on Twitter. I'm like, who's this Tanya person? Oh, Tanya is also following this other person, you know, Fridell. And then I'm asking Fridell, who's this Tanya person? It's my mom. And so Tanya's like stalking us on Twitter and following us. Really, uh, really interesting link. I think, yeah, you can find it. Um, she was really interested in what her daughter was doing. And uh, you can listen to the videos. There's a version in English and a version in Spanish. She recorded both for me. Um, I think it's really important to get um, parents involved in the education of their, their, their children. Um, and I think it's really useful for the students to actually go, wow, like my mom's actually paying attention to what I'm doing in school. She actually cares. Because all of us as teachers who have children know this, that our kids don't think we know anything. Like we're just mom and dad, we're not teachers. We can't teach them math. They'll ask math questions from someone else. Um, but having these parents involved in the education of their students, it, it's a big win. So let me talk a little bit about tools. This is a nod to a colleague of mine, really excellent blog post here that Tannis Morgan posted just before pandemic about online teaching with the most basic of tools. Really good post Tannis uh, made back in March last year, March 10th, the day before we declared this a pandemic officially. Um, when you're thinking about tools for your classroom, um, you need to think about these four different vectors, asynchronous synchronous, student to content and vice versa, student to teacher and vice versa, and student to student and vice versa. Yeah, the lazy teaching thing, Bill, is really important. The reactions are huge here. Okay, trust me, I get zero evaluations on my ACOAs. We can talk about ACOAs. Go to my blog, search ACOA. Um, I have the most popular blog post on my blog is called Teaching Evaluations, the Good, the Bad, and the Ugly. Um, where I pay a play off that Clint Eastwood famous movie. And I actually have quotes about my student evaluations there. And I will often get almost all tens or nines in the new evaluation system. Old evaluation system was a one. Um, but now I'll get some zeros because some students will literally say, this guy doesn't teach me. Or I'll get other students say, if if you're really interested in a deep learning experience where you're active in your learning process, definitely take Ken's course. If you just want a course where they teach you and tell you what to do, don't take Ken's course. And I get this every single semester. And part of the problem of a zero to 10 scale is the student who really wants to sacrifice you and hits you with a zero kicks the crap out of your average, by the way. Um, we could have a discussion about the problem with the COAs in another forum. Um, so tools, asynchronous, synchronous. Um, I, I almost laugh about the new hybrid learning. We've been doing hybrid since I've been teaching in the Tech de Monterey, because those of us who know about the CLU, which is a 308, which is the classic unit schedule of a Tech de Monterey class in university, which means three hours in class, zero in lab, and the eight represents the units, which is a Carnegie unit of amount of hours a student's expected to work per week. Um, don't wanna get into a big details about how we assign too much homework, but that's our model, right? 
Um, and so we've always had a model where we expect students to do stuff inside and outside of class. We've always done blended learning. We've always done hybrid learning. It's not new. Um, the way we think about it needs to be new about what we do inside a synchronous space. And I'll avoid the use of classroom because my bedroom right now is my classroom and the bedroom of both of our students is our classroom often. Um, but it's the synchronous space where I can see um, Bill hammering on the comments. Thank you, Bill, for making the chat active. And um, I can see what's going on in a synchronous manner and react to it right away. The fact that the recorded video, which won't show the chat actually, shows me answering that, uh, that Juan, pa Juan Paul said, parents are getting more involved on in education considering that school is now at home in this context of pandemic. Yeah, the, the parents are finally learning how difficult learning is, or they're also learning oh my God, that is so boring sitting in front of a computer and staring and listening to a teacher all day. <laughs> Welcome to many classrooms around the world where students are seated in a seat listening for an hour at a time. Um, so I think they're getting more involved in realizing what education is and what good education and what not so good education is. So asynchronous synchronous. Um, myself and many of our colleagues are big believers that we need to be much more intentional getting back to the third pillar of flip about what we're doing in the asynchronous space as well as the synchronous space, how we're using Canvas, how we're using other tools. I came up in the session I was in before about the use of Canvas. If you think your students know how to navigate your assignments in Canvas really well, let me tell you, they probably don't. Um, it would probably be instructive for you to sit down with your students and have them navigate you through Canvas to see how they use it because we're not very good at, at designing navigation in Canvas for our students. And we need to be careful about this. We need to be very clear about how we're doing with asynchronous and synchronous communication of our students. Um, I'm a big believer in asynchronous. Um, I've got slides in some of my other presentations about 24 seven teacher. We need to be careful about being super asynchronous that we're available 24 seven and our students expect us to be available 24 seven. But a lot of our learning happens outside the synchronous space. Most of the learning happens outside of the synchronous space. And we need to find affordances and a ways to encourage that and support that. Um, I could get into a lot more details of tools, but you need to make choice of the tools. And, and right away, I'm gonna say, if you're using WhatsApp to communicate with your students, please stop doing that because it is a violation of their privacy and you are exposing the phone numbers of 18 year old girls and boys to the other people in the classroom. And that is a really, 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 really bad thing in a Me Too environment. Um, so let me just say that straight out. If you're doing it, and I've had teachers say, I've never had a problem using WhatsApp. Well, you haven't, but you don't know if some of your students have been getting harassing messages over WhatsApp because you're sharing their phone numbers with everybody. Um, find ways to do synchronous communi asynchronous communication that does not expose the privacy of your students, please. Um, those of you that do, don't feel guilty. Um, I'm a privacy professor. Um, I think about these things all the time. Um, and this is part of my job. So um, I'm just going to advertise, please don't. Yeah, Remind uh, came up in, in, in chat and private messages. So another thing I like about Zoom is um, Alex sent it to me in a private message and then he sent it to me in a, in a public message. Um, one thing I teach my students is please take advantage of Zoom that you can send me a private message and I'll try not to expose you and say, oh, great. Oh, sorry, Gabriella. I didn't mean to say that that was your question. And then I just made you feel stupid or, or embarrassed in front of the class. Um, an advantage of synchronous online. And that's what this is what this is about. I, I skip slides. Navigation of the student with the content, we gotta be really careful about how it's done. We gotta be very clear about how it's done. It needs to be obvious. Um, uh, 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 one of the professors in the other session I was in yesterday said, but students never read instructions. Conscious pause there, the internet's not dead. Whenever a human says students something, 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 I like to replace that with humans something, 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 something. Because, oh my God, professors and everybody else, we don't read our emails and instructions and everything else. So stop pegging that on students. If the instructions weren't clear and if the students need to ask us for clarification for our instructions, it's probably because our instructions weren't clear. 
Um, I will admit, and Klein is laughing, I see that, um, Ken at 26 is a very different teacher than Ken at 52, okay? I'm much more empathetic now than I was before. And, and, and my attitude's changed, and I hope, um, I hope all of yours is as well. Signal's good for privacy, but also Signal, yes, does link ideas, Jorge pointed out there. Um, we do a lot of experimenting with different tools in our master's programs, Jorge and I. Student-teacher communication is really important. Um, I, I do a lot of things about student-teacher communication, and I have a lot of colleagues that I follow on Twitter that do this, and often we'll see messages happen. Um, I could probably find it. Shin Lee, one of my colleagues who teaches mathematics up in Canada at the University of Manitoba in Winnipeg, had a student come and talk to her. And she, she said, this was so wonderful. Like I was able to sit and talk with you and discuss my problems. And this is the first time I've ever sat and talked with a teacher. And I'm in my fourth year of university. And this has happened to me a lot of times. We need to be available for our students. We need our students to understand that we're accessible that they're invited to come talk to us, okay? I have a system, um, let me see if I can bring it up. Oh, that's the wrong one. Too many links, Ken. You can book me where students can go in and reserve appointments for me. I do not have office hours at 3 p.m. to 4 p.m. on Mondays and Fridays because it's very possible that my students have dance class at 3 p.m. to 4 p.m. on Fridays and cooking class at 3 p.m. to 4 p.m. on Tuesdays. Um, my schedule is open for them to reserve in whatever thing that works for them. Um, but Ken, you're just like, you're insane. You're making your students control your schedule. No, I'm not. Because I block out sections in there for when I'm teaching classes or when I have meetings. I block out big blocks of time for when I need a mental break. This entire week is basically blocked out because of our NP, right? Um, but I do allow the students to make the schedule at the time that works for them. One thing I've also learned though, is a lot of students are shy and they will not make this appointment because they're shy of, I'm the only one in the room with the teacher. Um, and by, by the way, in a Me Too environment and what happened a couple of years ago in the tech, I had to have a conversation with my students because I would have them come to my office. And I had to realize that I'm asking young women to come to the office of a 40, 50 something year old male um, and I had to have a conversation with them about that and say, if you're uncomfortable about that, that's okay. We can meet online. We can meet in a public space outside the Starbucks with your friend. Um, be very careful about how you're asking students to come and meet you in private. Some of them are just shy. So lately, besides the um, book your own time thing, I've also been making scheduled office hours that are open where I'm just here, show up in my Zoom, and they are more comfortable showing up when other people are there so that they kind of feel they have a camaraderie. But having this open links of student to teacher is really, yeah, Alex, the amount of, I, I've had deep conversations with my students about serious problems with their families, with psychological problems, with mental health problems, with bulimia, with all of those things. And it's really beautiful that they can, um, develop that confidence in me that they can share that in a private space with me. And this is why when they said we all can never have our door closed, I push back on that because my student is comfortable talking to me, but they're not comfortable talking in an open space where everyone can hear. Um, so we've got to be careful about that as well. Of course, I'm not a trained professional and, and I know where the line is and to say, look, you really, we got really good support services on campus. For us. And, and they don't even know sometimes because we tell them about this when they first arrive at tech and we bombard them with a whole bunch of information about services of the tech, they forgot about it the next hour. As our previous keynote says, they forget about things 20 seconds later. Um, but part of my role in this, in this communication with my students is, is finding them help, right? Even just one guy was sick and I'm like, go see the doctor. We're allowed to go see the doctor? Yeah, go see the doctor. Um, it's, it's a good thing. You should get, go do that. So please open up your doors um, or Zoom doors for your students. I'm waiting for time. I'm almost out of time. Student relationships. Do not assume that your students, just because they're from this generation and born in this millennium, know how to do things online. Teach them. Show them how to. They don't know. They don't know. You need to teach them how to do this. Okay. I'm good at this. I've been working online since the 1990s. 
Okay, I know how to do this. I know how to be comfortable online. Thank you, Alex. My daughter bringing me my vitamins. Um, and so don't assume they know how to do this. Teach them how to. Students, especially in a pandemic, are used to going for pizza, eating pizza, talking for three hours, and then starting to work on the project. They don't know how to do that online. Teach them. Okay. Resources. I'm almost out. Please check out the Flip Learning Network website. I was the uh, president of the Flip Learning Network for five years. I'm currently still on the board of directors of the Flip Learning Network. And um, it's an excellent resource about flip learning. We currently have a conference which runs next week, the Flip Tech 2021 free conference. And Ken forgot to put the links in there. I'll fix that later. But you could probably just Google it. Flip Plat Chat is something that happens on Twitter. Um, we have Facebook, Instagram, and a podcast. I, I didn't have the links in there. I put the links in there, but they disappeared. For those who are interested in how I made these slides, there's a software called reveal.js that you can use to make the slides like I'm making them into a web page. Um, some projects I do, actually, no, the links are there. So there's the FLM website. There's the Flip Tech 21. Sorry, I had to go down. Uh, if you navigate on this website, uh, there's left and right, and there's up and down, by the way. And if you hit the escape, it shows everything. Um, FLN on Twitter, FLN on Facebook. Uh, we have a Flip Learning Network Mac Latin America on Facebook that I created. We have an Instagram. I recorded various, I think, 42 podcast episodes about the Flip Learning Network. Some of them are really good. I'm really proud of some of them. Some of them are eh, not that great, but I, I did those. Um, Ken's projects. I record videos, um, little tip videos about uh, learning. Uh, yeah, you can do a PDF output. I'll, I'll try and link a PDF when I make a blog post later today, Miguel, because um, there is an export to PDF in this software. Uh, Tech Edu Tips, uh, I record videos, basic videos, like a video of how to configure your Zoom so that you know things work right, um, or uh, other random stuff like password managers for managing our passwords on the internet and other stuff, recording videos, go check out those. Um, I have a thing called EduCoffee that I usually run every day about 10 o'clock in the morning and sometimes at three o'clock. We miss the, hey, Ray, as I found you in the hallway, let's go for coffee at Starbucks because we're not walking through the hallways anymore. And so I've been offering this thing called uh, EduCoffee since April last year. Feel free to drop in. Um, in a second, I'll share the link here. Um, I don't share the link publicly to avoid Zoom bombers. Some of you might have had the pleasure of Zoom bombers last year. Um, but I do not share the Zoom link publicly, but it's been the same link for a year. Um, it's just casual. There's no topic. We just have coffee and chat about stuff. Um, but I think it's really important for mental health. And I shared about that last year on the RMP because they were asking me about the effects of mental health on, on teachers during education. I write daily on my blog. There's our colleagues, Edgar and Vero, on uh, the post from the other day. Um, I actually post a daily entry about my life during COVID-19 and, and what it's like uh, living through COVID-19. I just posted post number 400 and something yesterday. And um, go check out, I share about other things, share about on grading, I share about a lot of stuff in my blog. Um, and please use Yammer. Um, please learn how to use it. Please be active there. Please share what you're doing with other teachers. I know it's not, it's not Facebook. It's, you don't have to share your, your kids' birthday parties there. Um, it's about a professional tool, getting back to that fourth pillar of flip learning, the P, professional educator. We should be using these social media tools for talking to each other about what we're doing in education. So Yammer is a nice, what I call a walled garden. It's not the open internet. The only people there are our colleagues where we can share about our experiences learning or ask questions. So go ahead, if you check me out on Yammer, um, that link on the slide actually goes straight to my profile on Yammer and it'll show the posts that I've shared. Um, why were we migrated? I don't have the answer to that, Miguel. Um, my guess is economic, um, if, to be honest. But Roman Martinez and, and Pablo Ayala asked me many years ago, what's the best tool to use for this, Ken? And I said, it doesn't matter. Has absolutely no matter which tool we're using. It matters how we use that tool. Um, and just making a tool doesn't mean people are gonna use it well. And people talked about this in the session I was in earlier. Uh, giving your students a tool doesn't make them good at using it. It's a communication tool. Um, my guess is that it's a, it's a financial reason um, because we're in Office 365 and we're, we're cutting one cost and just integrating it into another cost. Um, 
No, nobody's told me, but I'm gonna guess that's the reason. But it's fine. It doesn't really matter which tool it is. Just use it. Just use it. Um, thank you. Um, my email's here. My website's there. My blog is the same place. Um, Twitter, uh, YouTube. You can find me there on YouTube. Thank you very, very, very much. Let me link the attendance thing again because I should, uh, unless someone beats me to it. Copy link. Make sure attendance. I'm sorry for giving a talk. I, I don't like giving talks, although most of us are good at giving talks. Um, my classroom is not like this. My, my throat gets tired. Um, it, my classroom is much more interactive. That's the way it should be. Um, one thing I'd like us to all think about is invite your colleagues to come and watch your class. When we first started thinking about Tech 21, and I don't know if you remember um, Alvaro, who came, Alvaro, uh, what was his last name, who came and he was a consultant that came and talked to us before we did Tech 21. One of the first questions he asked us was, how many times have you visited one of your colleagues' classroom in the last year? And how many times have you invited a colleague to come and see your classroom in the last year? We should be doing this. We should be sharing our, 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 our practices and our praxis and, and our good habits and our bad habits and our good ideas and our bad ideas with each other. It's really important. It's scary as heck though, because I guarantee you any of us, if our boss showed up to our classroom, we'd probably faint thinking, oh my God, I'm getting fired. Um, actually, I've got a story that that actually happened once, um, but I won't share who it was. But this, is, this should be normalized, right? We should be sharing what we're doing in our classrooms and we shouldn't be afraid to share. Um, again, my fifth T, trepidation and fear. Um, about making change is really important and we need to recognize that. So please invite people to your classrooms, uh, whether it's online or in the physical space. Um, uh, stay safe, stay healthy. Um, thank you, thank you very much for coming and um, contact me anytime, I'm really open. And if I don't answer you, please contact me again because you know how our email inboxes look, they get overloaded. Um, but I'm, I'm happy to share anytime. Uh, for those of you that are in education and you want me to come and talk to um, your class about education or someone else about education or your department about education, I'm happy to do that. I do that all the time. Um, uh, stay in touch, stay safe, stay healthy, and uh, be good. Thank you, everybody. I'll stop the recording now. Thank you, Ken. Have an awesome week, everybody. Thank you, Ken. Thank you. Get some rest. Thanks, Ken. It was great. Thank Much you. Appreciated. Stay in touch, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Ken. Thanks. And as I say to my students, I'm the last one to leave the room because often a student will stay and have a conversation okay. at the end. Like the captain of the ship, right? You go down with your ship is right. That's right. But the, Ken, the, the shy <laughs> students stay to the end all the time. <laughs> did you share the Zoom ID for your coffee talks? Um, no, I didn't. Let me do that right now. Thank you. Uh, and anyone can write me, but let me do it right now. Um, Edu Coffee. There it is. Oh, no, I need to copy all of that. Can I have a question? Yep. What platform do you use for your, for your blog? Uh, I use WordPress. Blog? I'm a big fan of WordPress. Actually, I've given, if you go to my blog and you search for WordPress, I've given a lot okay. of classes about setting up your own blog, actually. Um, okay. I like WordPress because it's easy to use. Um, I do a custom hosting of my own WordPress so I can do funky stuff because I'm a computer science nerd. But if you just go to wordpress.com, you don't need to give them money. They will give you lots of opportunities to give them money, but the free version works just fine. So okay. the Zoom link for EduCoffee is there in the chat. Um, I'll probably get back to regular coffee sessions next week. I think Vicky actually invited me in the SEDI in Guadalajara a few years ago or Goose to give a talk about using WordPress for blogging. And that post is probably still on my blog somewhere. And do you think students follow your blog? Mostly they do, or they do, it's funny. <laughs> it's actually pretty funny, they start doing it. And it's interesting when I talk about professional educator, they go, this guy actually cares about education and teaching and stuff. He isn't just teaching because he couldn't get a real job, right? <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> and, and they see this, they follow, me, they follow me on Twitter and they'll see my conversations on Twitter about education. And they'll see what I write on my blog about education. And they'll see that one of my pinned posts is about ungrading and they'll ask me about that, which I've actually implemented in the Tech de Monterey and I could talk about that another time. Um, but yeah, some of them do. And actually Fredell, who was in my class yesterday and in the, in the talk yesterday, she's now a teacher. 
Um, and so we've had conversations about, um, about teaching before she decided to become a teacher. She actually uh, contacted me a month ago saying, Ken, can you please share with me why you teach? Like I'm having this dilemma about should I be software engineer or should I go teaching? Because I know I'm teaching, I'm not gonna make any money. Yeah, that's true. Um, and and it's, a, it's a life's decision. So yeah, they definitely look at that. And, and being in the open is, is vulnerable. This is, not a, this is not a talk about open pedagogy, but I can definitely talk a lot about open pedagogy and why I do everything I do in the open. I shared about the fact that I got my, uh, my, I got my Pfizer shot a month ago. Um, and a lot of colleagues, a lot of your colleagues contacted me in private and said, Ken, but you already had Cancino. Why did you get Pfizer? Is it okay? Can I do this? And all sorts of like, they're all thinking about this because we're all thinking about this. But uh -huh. I was conscious talking about it in public because I believe it's something we really need to talk about in public. And I actually engaged um, Dr. Torre from Tech Salud, the, the director, that they need to talk to us faculty about um, these decisions about vaccinations. And maybe they'll do about it that tonight on their session. Um, but I'm very consciously you took, public. You took your first or your second shot? I already took my first. I registered for it and I took it. And um, yeah, they, they didn't go, hey, Ken, you've already had guns. You know, you can't have, I don't even think they need to know. To be but honest. you did, uh, did you, well, it's different technology. So I don't think it's going to, something it's, it's going to I've talked to doctors something bad I've yes. talked to doctors and my brother-in-law and other people and I follow the studies and I think it's important um can I, I'm a believer and take the first one that you have available and that's why I did it um but I'm a Canadian right now if I go to Canada they don't consider me vaccinated with Cancino it's not authorized in Canada or most oh, countries yeah. or even Mexico to be honest um yeah. but if I go to Canada I would have to quarantine for two weeks before I can do anything as a citizen, visitors, you guys can't go at all. Um, but if something happened to my parents and I had to go to Canada, I would have to wait two weeks before I could do anything unless I'm fully vaccinated, which means full vaccination according to the rules of the Canadian government. And I'll have to pass a positive COVID test as well. Um, they just changed the rules yesterday. If I go to Canada now, I would have to quarantine because I'm waiting for my second shot. But this is why I do- But you're taking your shot in Mexico or in yeah. US? Yeah, no, I just went to the regular site like all of us do, Mi Vacuna, I registered, and then I went to the Jalisco one and I registered on a Friday and I got an appointment for Tuesday. And my wife oh, had hers because, for Monday. But you, but, you had, but you didn't have the chance to choose. No, but I, I mean, didn't know what I was going to get and you will not know what you get. One of my faculty colleagues, uh, she registered, she asked me about this and she just told me yesterday she got AstraZeneca, which is fine too. I doubt we're going to show up and they're going to give us Cancino again. Um, if they did, I would have told them no, because they won't tell you what you're going to get until you show up. But okay. these are discussions we need to have. I invite everyone to check out the, um, the webinar on Facebook by Dr. Torre and company. Um, it's at 6 p.m., I believe, tonight. Um, yeah. They've been having really good um, webinars about this. And, and actually, the last one they gave, that was the most common question in the chat about, I've had Cancino, can I get another one? And they didn't answer it. And that's why I engaged him on Twitter. And I said, look, you need to, you need to talk about this. This is important. We're all concerned. And especially as faculty members, we want to travel to get, go to conferences. If we go to conferences in Spain or whatever, they're not going to let you in right now. Well, Ken, I have an idea about that. The mutations that are occurring. Yeah. Cancino was one of the first vaccines. Mm -hmm. So it was when the COVID was in its first stages. Yep. You know. Yeah. I don't believe that you're, if you're protected for a first stage uh, virus, yeah. that if you get a new one, a Delta, something like that, yeah. you're going to receive protection. I, I think we just don't know. The answer is we just don't know. Um, and and the, the latest results are saying if you're mixing, and especially the technologies, the I yeah. can't remember the, the, the other and then the mRNA, that you are more protected by having a mix of doses. And that's what's coming out in the news. That um, is if your body can sustain that. Well, yeah, I broke my leg three weeks ago and I got mm -hmm. my first dose of uh, Pfizer a week after breaking my leg and it kicked the crap out of me. I was like, I was out of energy for you, two you days. You were really hurting. <laughs> it, it hurt me for two days. Yeah. Um, so... Um, it's a personal decision. You should talk to your doctor as always. Yeah. Um, but yeah, 
And, and my respect to everyone who's um, there giving us the dosages it was really good service. Um, I got especially good service because I was in a wheelchair I'm with a broken leg and then got the express service. But um, my respect to all the doctors that are doing this work out there because um, they did a really good job. So any other thoughts? So you're in Guadalajara? Yeah, I'm in Guadalajara. Guadalajara. Yeah. Technically in Zapopan. Okay. I, I live, um, I can walk to the campus here. Okay. I'm close to the campus. I've been here okay, well. since 1995. Most of the years. Most of you, almost Mexican. <laughs> I, they've adopted me and, and they haven't kicked me out yet. But you're teaching computer, computer science department? Yeah, I teach software engineering and computing security. Oh, so, yeah. Yeah. But uh, my, okay, my main I, interest is pedagogy, though. Most of the work I do is about pedagogy. If I have any doubt about the blog, I'll let you know, okay? <laughs> oh, contact me. Contact me. Contact me in Gamma. Contact me, email, contact me anyway, and I can help you out. And, and honestly, I've got that book me system. Make an appointment with me and I'll sit down and do a, I'll walk you through it for 15 minutes or 30 minutes. I'm happy to help you go through this. Okay. For sure. Thank you. Yep. See you. Goodbye. Bye. Ken. Thank Bye, you everybody. very much. Yeah. Thank Bye, you very Ken. much, Ken. Thank you Thanks, very everybody. Much. Good to see you, Kleina. Bye. Good to see you too. Bye. Great Bye. talk, Bye. Ken. Thank you very much. Bye, Bye. Thank you, Miguel. Bye. Thanks, okay. George. Thanks, Thank Vicky. Okay, can, can you hear me? Yeah, I can, can hear you. Uh, okay, can open my door. It's I asked you about what kind of first. micro are you using? Pardon? What kind oh, of micro? Yeah, I have you? a very good setup. I have a, uh, a blue Yeti microphone. I have like a really good setup here. Actually, yeah. if, I, if, I, if I quickly search, um, I could show you my setup. I have a picture of it here on, yeah, there it is. I'll give you a link. And here. your handset is uh, Alpha, HyperX Alpha. Yeah. HyperX Cloud. Or there is a there's a link to my uh, desktop workstation downstairs. Okay. Um. So I've got actually. Well, actually, I, I'm in my bedroom right now, so I'm not in the exact <laughs> same setup because I had to move upstairs. I don't get to I don't get to move as much because my leg's broken. Um. But that's my setup, and I've had that setup before COVID because I was teaching online for Tech Twenty One nationally before we went actually when we went into lockdown I, all my classes except one was already online so it was like okay instead of teaching online from my office i'm teaching online from my and i've got a green screen and everything set up like i have a very very nice setup i recognize that not all teachers have this setup it's really hard for a lot of us to teach online with just a laptop i have two monitors actually in my office at the tech i have three um because it's really, really helpful to have multiple monitors when you're when you're teaching. It's the first thing that I recommend investing. Um, there's actually using Windows, right? Right now, I'm using Windows. Uh, usually, I'm in Linux or, uh, but sometimes in Windows. Zoom is much more stable in Windows. Windows um, that's why I definitely go back to Windows for Zoom. Um, there is a Dan Levy uh, book about uh, teaching in Zoom this in the links, but um, I highly recommend checking out Dan's work, Teaching Effectively with Zoom. Um, the second edition of his book came out. He actually gave a talk for us at the Tech of Monterey a few months ago. Um, but he talks about what he think are the most effective, and it doesn't have to be Zoom, but we're using Zoom, um, ways to improve our teaching online. And, and things he says is getting a second monitor is like, it's gold. And my students tell me this, they're like, oh my God, Ken, I got a second monitor and my life has changed. Um, because you're not just staring into this little fort. And plus when it's a laptop, your, your neck hurts because you're always looking at like this and you can't point where your camera is. And I've got like a remote camera so I can point it everywhere. Um, yeah. And I anticipate continuing this teaching from home for a long time. Um, I think so. And I'm happy about it. I, I, I'm, I'm an introvert. Um, you can't tell the way I'm with you guys, but I, I call myself a social introvert. I have no problem being home all the time. Um, and my coffee maker is just around the corner. And uh, the bathroom is just, you know, right around the corner. Um, and I teach nationally and I have students from all sorts of campuses and I actually love that. So um, None of my scheduled classes are in person next semester, except for a Semana 18 in December. So yeah, I, I like this setup. 
I'm comfortable with it. But I, but I do recognize lots of faculty who want to go to campus, and that's fine. Especially my architect friends, they're, they're, they're just dying. They're like, I can't teach online. I need to be able to see my students' models. Yeah. It's the same for the medicine doctor. Yeah. And I'm, and I'm teaching computer science. So I'm just like, well, share me your screen and let me see your code. So for, for us, it's, it's super easy. Easy. Yeah. So, uh, but I do recognize, yeah, you're right. You, you can't cut into bodies remotely um, and, and do other stuff like that. Um, so. We'll, well, we'll we have do. to see. We'll have to see how the hybrid uh, thing. It's know, hard, Omar. Out. I mean, I went and took my little session zero class. I know I've done this before. I've taught um, sessions for teachers where I have some in the classroom and some online, and it's really hard. Mm -hmm. Your students that are online are going to be thinking they're ignoring me. They're just paying attention to the ones in the classroom. And then when you start paying attention to the ones online, the ones in the classroom, are like, what? I came all the way to campus, you know, and I'm not even paying attention to me. Yeah. It's going to yeah. be really, really hard. Yeah, yeah. It's not and, easy. And, and our uh, keynote speaker was uh, highlighting that. I mean, he, uh, yes. he was saying it's right. in so many words. That I mean, was the first question, literally. and it was a great question. Yeah, um, he, 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 putting it I, on the table right there. They uh, actually, so, if you saw that, they made a video at the tech about session zero in the hybrid space, and they actually have me in the video. Um, but it was cool. only about 10 <laughs> seconds of Ken. And they, and they totally took it out of context. They made me sound like this is odd, the bestest thing ever. I'm like, I said, I, for some teachers and for some students, I think this is a good solution. And mainly the ones that don't have good equipment like I do. Um, and they, they twisted my words a little bit. And my wife got upset because I was wearing shorts in the video. Um, but uh, I, think, I think it's a good thing my daughter really wants to go back to campus. So does um, mine. Yeah, she's, she's and, and I get it. But my point to her is you're going to go there and you're going to realize not allowed to hug. The snacks aren't open. You can't hang out in the library all day. And, and your vision of what it means to be on campus and what the reality is, mm -hmm. is different. And I've gone to campus and, and I loved it. I ran yeah. into colleagues like Vicky and others. And I'm like, I'm so happy to say hi to you and see you in person. But we can't just sit down and have a coffee together with five or six people. Heck, you can't even take take off your. We're not supposed. We're not supposed really, to, but people I mean, do, right? That's um, you know five hours of mask in a row. It's. I, I broke my leg madness. two days before I was supposed to go back to work on campus three days a week, um, so I escaped. <laughs> but my colleagues are saying it's dumb. It's like a you're Freudian in a thing. There. Well, you're in a Starbucks. Basically, you're there with your laptop with your mask on the whole time. You can't do a Zoom session. You have to leave to do a Zoom session because you bug everybody. Like, I'd just rather be here. Yeah, it, it, it makes a lot of sense. And, and uh, I, I, I wanted to um, ask you one thing about uh, this uh, control, I mean, mm. element that Gabriela and other people, you know, uh, brought yeah. up uh, um, and how it's hard to let go of control. It is. And, and, and put it on, you know, on the other side. Yet at the same time, you know, in, in the, if you will, administration uh, faculty relationship, we have uh, the flip side of that coin, right? I mean, yeah. the, well, the, we're taking the attendance for this. Yeah, well, absolutely. I mean, and, and it is, you know, the Absurd. whole segment, you know, is uh, there's no choices here. I mean, it's, it's like this. So, so it's like a, you know, the flexibility is, it's like the, the uh, double speak from George Orwell, right? I mean, it's, you know, you, you say one I, thing, but you, think, you're actually doing the other. But I think it's I mean, mixed messaging. Mm -hmm. Because I remember when we first had, we used to do um, in January, we did these other meetings that were like RNP, but what do we call it? It was like a big meeting we had about the new teaching and everything. And they were talking about flexibility. But oh, then the jornadas, of, jornadas. Yeah, jornadas, academicos. And, and, and I, was I was sitting with a woman and she said, but my boss she's all about control. And, and I'm like, that's an anachronism. Like you can't have controlled flexibility. And, and because she was asking about um, uh, grupos departamentales, where everybody has to have the same rhythm, the same assignments and the same everything. I'm like, those are out the window. You can't have flexibility and control at the same time. And if you listen to the top level executives, David Garza, Roman Martinez, Salvador Alava at the time, because I would always talk with them because I, I'm not shy. I go and talk to those guys. And I, I've known David forever because he's a computer science professor. 
Um, they're saying this message, but at a department level, we're so used to control, right? And I know this, um, and I recognize this, and, and I saw this in the first semester of Tech 21, because we had this course, and there was way too many assignments. And I've been teaching computer science for 20 something years. I said, no, no, no. And I just adjusted it completely to my own course and I changed everything. But a lot of professors thought they're not allowed to change anything in the course and they didn't. And their students were dying and they were dying. And, and, and the answer later when we had a feedback session was, well, of course you're allowed to change it. And this was from a higher level executive, middle level actually, a division level said, they, they started to come back on their messages of don't change anything. And they started realizing we need to know that our teachers are the professionals in their classrooms. They're the experts of their learning, their students, and they need to have the permission to be flexible at how they change the content of the course, obviously within reason, right? Mm -hmm. We talked about mm -hmm. this yesterday in our session. It's like, you've got a laundry list of things you need to teach in this course that we were talking about what we need to do as leaders of this course design is, okay, this, these five topics, no way, you, you gotta cover this stuff. You can't miss this stuff in this course. This stuff at the bottom, if you got time, it's cool. And so you gotta have kind of a prioritization uh, and not super rigid. But I think a lot of, of our faculty, they received messages that you can't change anything. Um, and I actually cool. called, I called out a is. boss once who said that. And I said, because he complained later, he said, but, 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 but why aren't the teachers reacting to change? And I said, because I remember a talk that you gave. I remember specifically you saying, do not change anything. You yeah, said it. <laughs> and I, I called him on this because I, I, I don't care. And I'm not. I'm not scared of my job. They're, they even have little candaditos, right? Little, little logs next to, oh, yeah. uh, you know, from but, the but, elements but, of the course. Lock, but lock, you just lock, make lock. a copy of it and then you hide the old one and you change the new one. I know how to hack mm -hmm. this. I'm a computer scientist. I'm a security professor. <laughs> <laughs> I teach people how to do this. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. but you're right. Um, this is what we're suffering with. And my message is because I do talk with high level executives. Um, we know this. We, we know that we need to be flexible about it. But I think, I think Mexico has a culture that we're not used to being transparent and open mm -hmm. and honest at any level, teacher to student, but also administration to teachers. Um, and yeah. so they think if they send that message, it'll be perceived as a very weak message. It's, it's like, if you give you them know, any freedom, they're going to like, they just uh, do nothing. Know what, what, what if you don't take attendance, the nobody will come They to take your sessions. food for it and they pull you in and they start doing whatever they want and just get out of hand. So it's and, safer and, to and go think, with the don't change anything, don't touch it. Yeah, I think that's, or, or it's, or it's the, oh, I learned this as a Canadian. Um, we're telling them not to change anything. But we know there's a double speak where they know the real message is go ahead and change it, but just don't tell me because I'll get in trouble if I authorize for you to change it, right? Yeah. It's like the Mexican It's like the Mexican thing where they say, Oh, Ken, the wedding's actually at seven. We're telling everybody else six because in Mexico you tell them six so they show up at seven. But I know you will show up 15 minutes early. So I'm telling you the real time is this time. And like there's this baile that we do in right, Mexican right, culture. Right, 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 and right, so right, right. And so I think it is very much to do with that. Yeah, well, it's a, the, the don't ask, don't tell policy. Uh, I mean, it, it happens in other places. Remember, remember the Bill oh, yeah. Clinton my era. Da, my dad don't ask, taught don't me tell that. It. It's better to, better to ask forgiveness than to ask, ask permission. Ex exactly. My father taught exactly. me that. He's a military yeah. man. Yeah, yeah, it's, uh, you know, it's always been around and it will always, you know, be, but nevertheless, it, it creates, you know, all this noise, it, all this, you know. Uh, we, we preach transparency and honesty, and it's actually in our mission, um, but it's hard for us to do it because it's not part of a cultural context, I think. Um, and I get in trouble because I'm very transparent, mm -hmm. um, um, very transparent. Um, and, and I get in trouble for it and I, re I recognize it, but I would like the fact that I published that I was getting my COVID shot, um, people freaked out about it. Or, the, or two years ago when Me Too happened and it, it affected our campuses directly. 
And I sat down and had a conversation with my students about it. And I published on Twitter about it. And my boss came to me and said, no, 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 no. We don't, we don't talk about these things. And then four months later, when we started doing all the seminars and the groups and the therapy sessions and everything else, he was happy to volunteer me to be part of it because he knew I cared about it. But so it's like, we're really hard at being open about these things. And so uh, it's, it's hard. Well, yeah, but, but it, it puts up, uh, you know, an extra an extra difficulty on, on the whole flipping concept right because oh, the, the whole flipping idea it, it, you know it's, it's predicated upon trust me i guarantee of, i'll have a zero on one of my evaluations i i there will be one student who says this mm -hmm. ese profesor es un way no me enseña nada literally that's what they say yeah, and well and actually um i don't know if you know but we had um the academic uh senate i put a proposal um, a couple of years ago, because I had a conversation with Manuel Zertuche when we changed our ECOA, um, I said, if a student, they were complaining about nobody reports uh, Integridad Académico. And I said, well, because we're scared. <laughs> because if I report an Integridad Académico and that student beats the crap out of me on my ECOA, that affects me. And I said, not me. Exactly. Ken's always talking for the general we community. This is mm -hmm. my yeah, 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 culture. Yeah, yeah. And he said, no, it doesn't. I said, okay, let's do the math. I've got most of my students giving me nines. And then this one student or two gives me zero. Let's do the math. How does that work out? Oh, crap, Ken, you just fell before below seven. Yes. And I said, the exactly. recommendation is if a student's under academic integrity violation, they can still do the ACOA. We value their input. They have a right to do their input. But you should not be including that in the average of the professor. That passed the Senate. I proposed that it passed, but we've never implemented it because we don't really know how to. As well as I passed another one about attendance because this happened to me, a student asked me to an erase an attendance absence. And I said, oh, I could have made a mistake. Send an email to your director with a copy to my boss and to me telling me which day that I made a mistake and I will change it. Didn't want to do it because he didn't want to be transparent and open. And he said, no, mm -hmm. no, 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 I, I yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, you it's all right. There's there's this one obvious just <laughs> answer on my ECOA. Um, and so I also passed that in the Senate as well. Um, but nobody ever wants to talk about these. And actually our bosses, when they explained it, they said, we're not actually making this happen uh, mechanically because we actually believe this never happens. <laughs> nice. Mm -hmm. I can show you examples <laughs> on my own where it mm -hmm. Well, one, one thing that could happen regarding that particular uh, um, aspect, the, the ECOAS. And ECOAS like are the, worse the, now because we're actually reporting grades while the students are doing the ECOAS. Yeah. The Tech 21. Yeah. It's, it's yeah. worse and we need to yeah, have this that's conversation. Terrible. Yeah. And well, nobody we, wants we, to have this conversation. The ECOAS are One a thing we mass. could do is uh, can the old, the old uh, East German judges, you know, yeah. thing with, with the platform, you know, diving and stuff, you know, well, you take off. The, the the highest, the you know, highest two of the, the highest you know yeah. a little person and the lowest right and then take the middle right and and that any that's really any of our experts in statistics in the tech de monterey would tell us that we should be using trim means or layers of course but but we don't we I mean, don't and we I mean, we boil down a thousand points of data because the students answer like 13 questions and we only use mm -hmm. three of them and, yeah. and they put a whole bunch of comments, but we don't use those. They boil down like a thousand points of data, worse, like 5,000 points of data over the year into one number for your professor. And that, that's not healthy. And, and that number is, uh, as you that, demonstrated, a, no, heavily big, affected by, by the guy. Yeah, it's a big hammer. Guy that, that you asked to send the email and then it's going to hammer classify. you. Right? You can't apply for Professor Inspirador. You can't. Same. But, but it could be solved uh, relatively easily and, oh, yeah. and would be backed up by any statistician, science. right? You yeah. know, science, exactly. So what the hell? I mean, yeah, I know I've had this conversation many times, but it's it's the answer is usually, well, it's not that important. We're not going to make big decisions based on that number. So it's not really that's what they say. But the truth is, it's really it's, important. Yeah, that that again is not true. They they do. I mean, and and, and it's, it's used as a you know 
uh, I guess it's used as a, a hammer, right? Like you know, seven years ago, this happened. Um, actually, it was one, it was one of my previous boss who used to be my student was my boss. And, and that happened with that one student. Um, actually, one student threatened me with something. And he said, pues espérate que llegue la coa. <laughs> and yeah. I went up immediately to him and I said, this is what happened. I know this is going to happen. I know I'm going to have this kind of band that's going to kick my crap out of me in the ACOA. I, I'm telling you now before I receive it, so it's not a reaction to my numbers. I'm preemptively telling you this mm -hmm. is going to happen. Mm -hmm. And it did. I had that happen like this period one in uh, concept art. We had this guy that was like worst student I've ever met. And the echoes were happening just as we were doing the evaluations. And it's like, oh God. It happens and he, all the time. But it... he did tell us like, you're going down. And it's like. It's a bad instrument. We know it's a bad instrument. Um, it hit my average like really bad. Yeah. But they could uh, make it be better very quickly. Answer. Go ahead. My yeah. daughter's my daughter's walking behind me. No, um, yeah. I've had students come to me and say before, yeah, I finally learned that it's my job to learn myself. Sorry about the ACOA. I kicked your crap out of you when I was a student. But now I know <laughs> that you were right, that we need to learn ourselves. So it, it's all of the studies show that it's an imperfect instrument because students are not a good evaluation of who's a good teacher. Um, not even to get into the discussions that females are evaluated much more harshly because if a male is assertive, you're assertive. If a female is assertive, she's a bitch. Um, and so there's all sorts of cultural dynamics or a young teacher versus an older teacher. I know I get better evaluations as a foreigner. I can get away with crap because I'm a foreigner. Whereas a Mexican teacher can't do the same stuff that I do. Mm -hmm. And I know this, I recognize this, this is true um, because I can get away with stuff because I'm a foreigner with my bosses and with my students as well. Yeah. Recognizing yeah. that my student, my daughter doesn't want to be on camera. This is why I never force students to be on camera because, um, yeah. Yeah, that, that's also very good. I appreciated your comments regarding not forcing anybody to either be on camera or to even attend class. I mean, it's... Uh, you know, it's complicated. You know, they, they it's just, complicated. Yeah. It's it's. I've had no, student, no. I had this one student whose parents had both died. He's basically the breadwinner of his family. He lives with his dad, which is his abuelo. But his his abuelo's like in the hospital. He's living in some pueblo outside of Guadalajara, and he's like, "Can I can't always come to class because I was just working all day, and then I'm teaching in this other school, and then I'm like." Watch the video when you can, and I gave him the final exam on a different day, and. This is a reality. Yeah. yeah, we had a case with a girl that her father died of COVID like mid semester and she was absent for the rest of the semester. But we talked with her like once and the way she talks and the way she's acting and the way she took up like all his all the responsibility for her family. And you go like, you know what, you've got whatever you want for a grade, just do the work whenever well, you can. I, I just, uh, uh, Miguel, yeah. uh, my colleague from Puebla, who, uh, who's, he's here at EduCoffee every day. This is basically EduCoffee. This is what we do, um, by the way. Yeah, yeah. I there, know. We were... there's, there's the link again for EduCoffee. But um, this is usually what the conversation is about. And sometimes it's colleagues from the tech. And here's the interesting thing about EduCoffee and other things. None of us, I don't know, maybe, I don't think any of us work together. None of us have the same boss. The, the, the conversations we can have are very different than mm -hmm. if it's a for like uh, high level directors on the campus and the, and the tech asked me, how do we implement EduCoffee for like los rectores and everything? I'm like, you know what? It's not going to work. You can't just go, okay, everybody, you're on a coffee break. You're not allowed to talk about work now or politics. It'll never happen. Politics always happen. So the yeah. fact that I don't work with any of you changes my conversation and and often in, in educopy is often like people from other countries and stuff um we need to be able to have these type of conversations we're having right now it's an important part of our 
coping mechanism. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I, you know, I, I just heard. <laughs> For sure. Uh, it's like someone uh, else thinks like me. Oh, my God. I know. I, I just heard Sunis, uh opinion on an, an anecdote about that student that, uh, you know, you just uh, heard her talk and, and, and express herself, you know, well, this person is way on top of, you know, uh, the material and everything else. And I just had a situation this semester with a student who uh, didn't turn in the initial assignments and hadn't turned in the first activity for the first partial. And, and you know, but eventually the, for the second partial had a team assignment and the team assignment was the best team assignment I've ever seen in this class. Uh, probably forever, right? And I particularly had this, this uh, it was about this film in the back, right? Uh, Spirited Away by Hayao Miyazaki's, right? Uh, I don't know if any of you are fans of anime, but uh, anyway. No, I can tell you are. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, really? and thank you. It's, it's, I, I love that when teachers um, uh, make their personalities shown in class, because actually I'll do say this and like, Oh, there you are. Online. Oh my God, you play video games, Ken? Yeah. Uh, I, I, yeah was using the, I was using this background for evaluation. Awesome. <laughs> I was actually just telling uh, Jorge Rodriguez, who's, uh, who's, uh, was in our session. He's often in um, Educopia. I just, I sent a picture. I won't make it public, but I said, yeah, basically our uh, class just became Educopia. Um, but this is, this is what I think it's really important that we need. Um, hopefully you're doing this because for me, um, and the high level execs notice this, they asked me how to make this happen. Like, I don't know if you were involved last year, we had this kind of, uh, was it during RMP where a whole bunch of professors were sharing like tips about teaching online and stuff when we could submit a proposal. And there was like 10 different categories. And one of them, well, it was like, most people are teaching how to use Kahoot and tools and recording videos and evaluating. And there was one section, which was basically mental health. I'm the only one who submitted something. Mm. Yeah, well, so I was like mm. my own track. <laughs> and I got mixed in <laughs> yeah. with some other track. Yeah. <laughs> but, but this is for me is what that's about. Um, so it's, it's well, a really, really well, important part of my practice. This guy that I was uh, telling you about, uh, his, his name was Miguel, right? And, uh, you know, I realized he was a part of that team that submitted that great, you know, job, but he hadn't submitted anything else for the rest of the course. Well, um, you know, I engaged him and we began to talk and then he sent me, a, a, I don't know if it was an email or, or, a, or, or an inbox or something you know, just telling me, you know, give me, you know, give me some chance. I'm, I'm kind of like, you know, having trouble. I'm kind of yeah. depressed or whatever. Okay. And, and so I immediately realized that this guy, you know, was different, but you know, uh, long story made short, uh, the final paper that this guy sent me was something that you do not see published in journals. It was just way, way, they cared. way. They got beyond. engaged. Yeah. Um, and, and there's a good story I have. There was this student, um, he was my student. This is like, oh my God, this is like 2002. And um, he's just like the biggest smart ass in class, always disrupting. Um, and I remember if, if you know Campus Guadalajara, by the way, Froy, uh, Jorge Rodriguez says hi. He says, Froy's a good guy. Um, and uh, he, 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 I remember I was on like the second floor between the admin building and classrooms two in Guadalajara. And this student started talking to me and told me that his parents were getting divorced and, and like he was like thinking it's his own fault and should he be dropping out and I'm like, I had this conversation most of it was listening to him and the main point I was making is your parents relationship has nothing to do with you it's not your fault it's it's, it's okay you all of a sudden the students like the guy who's like telling other kids to shut up so they could pay attention in class like he just flipped um because of the fact that we showed we cared and, and listened to him and had a conversation for him. Turns out his mom is one of our colleagues on campus. I didn't know this at the time, she still is. Um, and I didn't know this at the time. And, and I know him really well. And I would have conversations with him later because he'd come back to the campus and, and I'd invite him to get classes. And I asked him, David, do you, do you remember this conversation? No, not at all. And I said, actually, the funny thing is you impacted my pedagogy because it, this made me realize that the effect that we can have with just like 
30 seconds of attention to a student can just completely turn them around in their attitude to the classes and all of a sudden they could create like amazing work because they they care about your class um just just amazing stuff the fact that he doesn't know um i actually talked to his mom about this years later um because i thought it was interesting <laughs> but uh no we can have a massive impact on our students it's yeah who amazing. knows it's probably somewhere in the, and most of us say know, this isn't my job right most of us say that my job is filling them with content. But, but, but you know, but you're wrong. No, and they're I mean, wrong, that's, 100 percent wrong. You couldn't be more wrong. The I mean, shit that, I teach that, in I the class, sorry. they're not going to remember 20 years later. They're going to remember that I told them that learning and continuing the learning is important. I told them that these relleno courses about communication are going to be way important to you when you're graduated later. And oh, look, this invited speaker who's a student from 20 years ago told you the same thing. He says, please pay attention to those communication courses. Please take a mic microeconomics course because it'll be really important when you become a software engineer later. Um, yeah. yeah. So well, those are the things they remember. Uh, uh, absolutely. Absolutely. And, and what's up, buddy? Well, um, I, I, Thank you. I'm going to have to go get my haircut. I yeah. have an appointment, you know, but it's, you know, but, but yeah, it's, yeah, we should. It's, thanks for staying. Break. Please stay in touch and drop in Thank for you Coffee can. anytime. Yeah. Thank it's you. really, really a pleasure. Ken. Which thanks campuses are you from? I'm guessing Monte Freud's, you're from Monterrey, Omar. I'm from Monterrey. Yes. I'm, actually I'm from Venezuela. That's, that's yeah, where I, was I, I figured so. Yeah. <laughs> you're but, a fellow but, foreigner. Uh, and yeah, Freud? Yeah. Are you uh, in Santa Fe? You're in Santa Fe with Jorge then. Okay. Yeah. And Sune? Ciudad de México. Okay. Was in Estado de México? No. You well, moved. You moved. National. Yeah. The campus is almost ready, I assume. Uh, I don't know. I haven't gone. I've been to Estado de México, <laughs> but I haven't been to CCM just for the uh, for the RNP, the Reunión Nacional, before everything happened. Before everything happened, yeah. No, I remember all those campuses. Heard your campuses. Well, stay in touch, guys. All right, take go. care. Bye-bye. Bye. My kids and get See breakfast. You. Thanks a lot, Ken. All right, bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Gracias.